Hi everyone, welcome to Privacy Ninja's weekly podcast series. My name is Andy from Privacy Ninja. And with us today, we have Dexter from Antihack. They specialize in cybersecurity services and penetration testing. And we also have Ethan and Jimmy from Policy Work. Hi guys. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us on the show today. So Ethan and Jimmy, can you guys introduce yourself to our listeners and what does Policy Work does? Okay, I, uh, I'm uh, Ethan here. So uh, Policywork actually is, uh, buys over endowments and sells them to investors. So the, the main bulk of people that actually approaches us is uh, people who have a financial uh, crisis and they need advice on how to get more cash out of their endowment policies. So that is where we come in to help them on uh, trying to mitigate or trying to uh, help them with their financial situation uh, in this case. So we offer up to 10% more than the surrender value. So if let's say they, they return the policy to insurance companies, they may get $5,000 and we will offer them up to $5,500. So at least there is something to take back rather than less uh, in this case. Wow, that's interesting. This is the first time I'm actually hearing of this. So you mean anyone uh, who has a, uh, who is servicing their insurance plans can just sell it off at any time and you guys will buy it over and give a better price than what they would get if they were to surrender to their insurance company? Uh, yes, yes and no. Because uh, for certain policies, uh, for, for us, we still need to look at the amount of margins that we can make of the policies. So if it's not interesting enough, uh, yeah, I'm sorry we can't buy over. But definitely we can give you uh, some general tips on how to uh, approach your situation uh, in this case. Oh, okay. Then uh, normally how long uh, does the insurance plan you know, need to be running for you guys to consider to buy over someone's uh, uh, policy? Oh, yeah. In this case, generally it's about one third of the uh, term. So let's say it's a 25 years policy, uh, it needs to be paid up for eight years before we will start to consider them. But of course, uh, there are actually private investors outside there that will actually consider even from the second or third year or even the first year. Wow, okay. I think it actually makes a lot of sense because basically someone who buys the policy, right, then after that, they've been servicing it, they've been paying it diligently monthly. Maybe they suddenly come to a financial crisis for example, COVID. So then they do not want to service it anymore and they sell it off to you guys and you guys have buyers also to buy over the policies. And basically the first few years that the original owner of the policy has paid up for them. So they confirm will make a profit. Is my understanding correct? Uh, yes, correct. Because uh, if you actually look into your insurance contract, uh, we, we are actually here to educate people about all this, uh, the big mumbo jumbo, but actually it's not so mm. difficult. Uh. So for the first few years, there are actually some fees. They call it a distribution fees uh, that need to be paid to the insurer, to the agents, to, to anyone who needs the, the sale. Uh. So these are the amount that will actually be upfront paid to all these people. So that's why you can see that the amount of money that you get back will be much less than what you put in. So that is how it works. Then along the way, when the policy continues, then they start to make more money from the returns. And at the end of the day, right, then you get back uh, your amount plus the interest that will be given to you at the end. Wow, now okay. We, yeah. Now we face to the, a lot of people come come to find you guys to sell their policy. Yeah, after COVID, these now are sales increase. A lot of people increase. need money. Eh? <laughs> uh, Did they come yes. to find you? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so, okay, so before I answer my question, so maybe I first introduce myself as well. So uh, my name is Jimmy. I'm a co-founder of Policy Work. Uh, so in this, in this company, uh, I'm in charge of the social media and website maintenance of our company and also to go out and try to network with as many people as possible, especially uh, financial advisors because financial advisors are our main source of referrals. Why financial advisors? Because uh, they are the ones who can monitor their clients' premium paying progress. And then at any point in time, if they, are, if they know that their clients miss the premium payments. So that is an early insight that suggests that 
they are they unable to continue service the policy. So that's where they have the option to contact us for us to consider the buy over of the policy. Yeah. Wow, that that's a really smart move. Eh? Come to think about it, uh, the 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 agent who's who is selling the policy to the original owner, right? Uh, wouldn't really care uh, who is the owner of the policy as long as someone is servicing the policy, right? Someone continues to make the monthly payments, the financial advisor still gets his commission monthly up to when the commission stops, of course. So I think, yeah, it's a good move that you guys can work with directly with the financial advisors so that they can, you know, quickly switch the owner just in case the original owner, you know, has issues uh, paying the monthly uh, policy amount. But this is the first time actually hearing about all this. Eh? Dexter, you heard about this buying over of policies before or not? Nope. That's why I found them and I invited them to our podcast because I, I find that they are doing something different from other people. That's why. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. And also the yeah. name Policy Woke uh, sounds very, very interesting. Can you guys share how do you come about your name Policy Woke? What does it stand for? Uh, I like Ethan share. Ah, uh, sure. Okay. Uh, if you look at the breakdown of the name, uh, okay, basically a uh, policy. So we, down here, we are talking about insurance policies. Uh, so it can be endowment, even whole life, ILPs, uh, universal life, anything to do with insurance, anything to do with uh, cash value. Yeah, we will take a look. So that is policies. Uh, then work. Okay. When we come to work, right? Uh, uh, have you guys heard of the work salary, man? Have you heard of what? Work salary uh, man? Work salary man, yes. Work um, salary man. Work salary man. No, not, not really. No. no, no, haven't heard before. <laughs> okay, so the, the work connotation itself is, is talking about uh, waking up to, to be work of a lot of things. Mm. So when we are very young, we are naive, we don't know a lot of things, we are ignorant. So down here in the company, uh, we believe that education is very important, uh, especially in finances. And uh, a lot of people make financial things very, very complicated, uh, very, very difficult to understand, or even uh, a turn off, uh, basically. So what we want to do is make it interesting, uh, motivating, and fun. So it's really about the fun factor over here. But of course, uh, the policy itself, they are also asleep uh, when people surrender them. So it is not achieving its value so that is where we want to work the policies up give them to the correct owners who actually value them in this case nice that, that makes perfect sense to me you know you guys will touch on and review the policy and then you also wake up the, the owner of the policy whether you know it's time to to sell and whether you can help him out in any difficult situation really really interesting name on how you guys uh founded this company. So what inspired you to go into this area of business? Okay, uh, for me, because I actually did a part-time uh, insurance agent for one year with AIA. So uh, I didn't sell a lot of policies, but uh, I actually met a lot of people uh, coming to me, okay, asking me, uh, what do I do with this endowment plan? I, I bought, I'm paying a whole life plan for 10 years with it. I don't even know what, what I'm doing with it. Then they start to compare the returns from the policies. Uh. So they look at our friends, they invest in the stock market. Hey, I'm getting 8 to 10% returns from my stock market. So for those people who, who approaches me, they'll be like, hey, my policy is only giving me 2 to 4% returns uh, in this case. So that, that, that is like such, such a huge difference. So why am I doing my money in this case? Mm. Am I doing the wrong thing? Yeah, that, that will be, they already cross a lot of people's smile in this case so for yeah. us yeah so for us we actually talk talk to them uh, let them know uh, what is opportunity cost uh, which is actually the the uh, better alternative from the current situation okay i understand um and also what are the maybe some of the challenges that you face uh, in in running this business you can share to our, our listeners I, I believe you will experience some challenges, right? Because from what I hear you say, education is key and a lot of people don't know about this. Uh, yes, correct. Uh, there'll be a lot, uh, okay, when, when we meet uh, all these financial advisors, uh, they actually tell us or they question us, is this legal or not? Uh, am I breaking the law or not? 
can this really be done or not? So there will mm. be a lot of all these questions, le legal issues, uh, even uh, what, what happens if uh, I, I die, then the, does, does that mean that the policy uh, benefit the other person? Uh, uh, yes, de definitely in this case. Uh, because uh, for the policies, uh, uh, okay, there are four parties involved in the policies. So normally it's the same person. But I name out the four, four parties. Uh, one is the owner, one is mm. the payer, the, the one who pays the, the, the policy, one is the beneficiary or basically the person who benefits if something happens to a person uh, or at the end of the, the policy's termination. And also the last one is the life insured, the, the, the basis of the contract uh, basically. Mm. So for the first three, which is the for owner, the payer, the beneficiary, yeah, it can be changed. But the life insured cannot be changed. So there is some uh, consequence when you sell your policies. But it should so, be a, yeah. so is it uh, to in layman is like, whoever is taking over then from that person and the other person dies the person who is paying it the new person who's paying it will get the money or what uh yes correct that, that is okay. how it will work i understand yeah. okay but you, you don't have to think of it this way but rather mm. because you you let go of your policy already you know that mm. you cannot service or you yeah. don't need it anymore yeah so to you it's it's not it's worth nothing to you yeah so why yeah, not sell right. it for something more yeah yeah so that is how Understand. we help them in this case. Okay. Yeah, I I very I'm very curious. Uh, then who would be the, the buyers that wants to buy over all the policies that cannot be serviced anymore? Who are your top buyers? Okay. Uh, for the top buyers, it will actually be financial professionals because for them, uh, they are in the business for so long already and they know uh, what, what to do when, when anything happens to the policy. Uh. So they are the ones who who understand, so they buy over all these policies. To, to them, uh, they, they understand this thing called risk. So risk is something uh, in the stock market that is a lot of risk. For the endowments, it's very little risk because it's guaranteed by insurance company. Mm. So if I'm able to get the same returns just by buying an endowment plan rather than going for the stock market, yeah, well, why not to them? Uh, so that is how they, they will value it. So when you say the financial professionals themselves uh, are your top buyers to buy over, you know, uh, people's policies that they cannot service anymore. Uh, have you experienced any scenario whereby the financial advisor himself, you know, come and buy over his clients' uh, policies? Oh, uh, in this case, uh, because of conflict of interest for the financial advisors themselves, uh, they cannot buy over their clients' policy. Ah, okay, but they can buy over someone else's, like, just not their own client. Yes, correct. Right. Yeah, because there's, uh, there's what you call uh, mor moral uh, hazard. Mm. Because can you imagine, uh, um, let's say you want to engage a hitman, and yep. you contact the hitman to, you know, kill this somebody, and this somebody happens to be the life assured of the policy. And... <laughs> The person engaging the man is the beneficiary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the moral moral hazard we are talking about. So for so for us as a company, we help to uh minimize or, or if possible even prevent the occurrence whereby the buyer and seller meet. Yeah. So we avoid this buyer and seller meeting for happening. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that makes perfect sense. Thank, thank you for explaining it to me. Then how do you guys go about facilitating the, the buying and selling of a certain policy? Do you guys have a platform that people can go to or how do uh, people contact you? Oh, uh, okay. So we are contactable via a few social channels. So one is our website, uh, www.policywork.com. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, and telegram channel so for each of these you just search for the word policy work and you should be able to find us on those channels mm, okay, okay thanks and do you guys also do policy review you know uh pro bono for anyone out there who's thinking maybe to let go of his policies uh well the least we can do is uh let's say if someone uh uh, wants to let go of the policies, 
um, well, if they give us the policy information, like for example, the current surrender value and the premium, annual premium, things like that, we can help to calculate the, the opportunity cost, which is the internal rate of return of the policy. Yeah. And then based on that number, they then get to decide on whether they want to give out the policy or continue to service the policy. Yeah. So that's the very least we can do. Mm, I understand. Okay. So to our listeners out there, those who want, you know, thinking of uh, surrendering their policies, okay, you can uh, speak to policy work. These guys will, will let you know if they're willing to buy it over. And if they do, they'll give you a much better price than, you know, if you surrender it back to the company that uh, pro provided you the policies. And also to financial advisors out there, if you guys experience any of your clients experiencing difficulty to pay or service the policies, okay, feel free to talk to policy work. These guys will help you to buy it over and continue the, the, the plan. It's really interesting to know that this is uh, going on. Okay, and what are your future plans for your business? How do you see policy work will grow? Because I see you guys are actively out there, you know, providing awareness and uh, and knowledge about what you guys are doing. And I learned from you guys that actually it's, it's legal and it's perfectly fine to do so. And actually you're helping a lot of people. So what are your future plans for this business? Okay, sure. Okay, for, Wait, I got for us... I got one question. So can third party yeah. websites without license actually help you guys resell? Or do they or they cannot help you resell this service that you are doing? Uh, so example, like let's say like a privacy ninja, they, they want to reach out to their customer for you uh via their website, like maybe post some advertisement. They are not allowed to do it, right? Yeah. Do I need a certain form of license or approval from any authority to blast out uh, about privacy work and what you guys do? And then people, you know, I can resell your services for you. Can I do such a thing or do I need some form of license? Uh, te technically speaking, uh, we will not encourage that because uh, ultimately the, this financial industry is heavily regulated by MAS, the mm -hmm. uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Mm -hmm. So even if we want uh, Privacy Ninja to help us, right, uh, yeah. we will need to at least uh, brief through the 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 content so that we do not misrepresent any of uh, our intentions in this area because for for re i have to reiterate this again uh, uh insurance is a long-term commitment and uh, we do not want people to surrender their policies for nothing and mm. that, that is the worst decision you can make so uh, yeah if you surrender a policy maybe uh, you will lose up to 60% of your money that you put in already. Yes, it's so, like Karanguni. You sell your thing to Karanguni, you lose a <laughs> pawn shop. You're like a pawn shop for, for insurance. <laughs> yeah, correct, they correct. Pawn, yeah, they pawn their insurance policy to you and then and then they sure lose a lot of money. Yeah. It's somewhat like dealing with resale flat, if you think about it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I just want to iterate what Ethan mentioned. So, um, so buying an insurance policy is a long-term commitment. So if you surrender early, it will lead to high surrender charges. Yeah. Mm. But and most then, of the time, most of the time people who go and surrender is because they got no choice. They really like going to like become bankrupt really. They need the yeah, money. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. but having said that, right, because although we are a brokerage business, mm. um, we never ever encourage anyone to sell to us even for the sake of selling, because um, when someone tell us that they want to give up on the policy, right? We first ask them for the reason why they want to give up on the policy. Yeah. yeah. So as Ethan mentioned, we'll accept reasons that relates to financial stress. Like for example, loss or job income, or they got into credit card debts. Then they sell the policy to us to encash. So, that they so can the, pay down the most common one is credit card debts, is it? <laughs> the one that those normally people come to you, what do they, what do they tell you? Um, yeah. reduction or loss of job income. That's the oh. most common reason. Yeah. So now, now then this period should have a lot of, like sudden boom, right? Ah, yeah, yeah. We do have a sudden volume in uh, queries in giving up the policies. They find yeah. you from Facebook or what? Uh, through website and Facebook mainly. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, Facebook. okay. So I also want mm. to stress that uh, because we are strictly a brokerage business, uh, mm. We do not have a regulatory license for financial yeah. advice. So, mm. 
So as a business, we never ever advise anyone on whether to sell policy to us or not. Yeah. What we can do is to provide facts and figures about the policies they have. Like for example, we give them, based on the numbers they give us about the policies, we will reply them on the internal rate of return of their policies. And based on that number, they still get to decide on whether they want to give out policies or not. Yeah. So it's a little bit like giving them a second chance on whether to give up or not. Yeah. Because we don't want, we don't want a situation whereby, whereby after they sell the policy to us, uh, it actually ruined their financial future. Yeah. We don't want that to happen. Understand yeah. you guys really think through for your client, you know, for potential clients first, and you guys do kind of like a KYC process, you know, know your customer. Why the, you find out a reason why you want to give up, they really cannot afford it anymore. What are the reasons behind this? And then only then you advise them and tell them what is the policy surrender value worth that you can give to them. Then you guys proceed with the transaction, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. correct. I think a, a fun fact about me and G, uh, Jimmy, right? Actually, we, we met each other on a personal finance forum. So mm. in this case, we actually, we, we, we are very into personal finance and we would love to help people in this case. So that, that is why uh, the, the vision of the company is in this case. Nice. Uh, nice. Thank, mm. Thanks for, for sharing. Um, and also, do you see policy work um, expanding globally or you guys only focus in Singapore? Is there any regulations in place that you cannot serve, uh, you know, the, the global markets for overseas insurance policies? Uh, for now, it's only the Singapore market. Um, mm -hmm. But in the future, currently not a priority, but uh, I believe Ethan is considering tapping into the Hong Kong market. Uh, Hong, but, Hong Kong. Yeah, because Hong Kong, um, I think based on Ethan's understanding, is a big market, right, when it comes to cash value insurance policies. Uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, correct. So uh, actually on, for Hong Kong, right, because there are a lot of uh, Chinese people buying insurance policies through Hong Kong. So that is where it's a very big untapped market. Uh, in the US and UK, in fact, uh, it's a very uh, well oiled industry, uh, meaning to say a lot of people has been doing that for at least uh, 50 or for especially UK, at least uh, 60 years in, in this business already. It's just that it's very new in Singapore. So that is why uh, when we look at the history, yeah, it, it actually makes sense uh, to set up one in Singapore since we are financial hub anyway. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so actually, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So just, just to elaborate. Uh, so, it, so in the UK, this trading on insurance policies is already a virtual market for 60 years. Yeah. And then uh, in Singapore, it's only about 10 years old in the market. Because there are also other players who are also into this. So what we are trying to achieve is to make this trading or insurance policies become a mature market in the future, similar to the what the UK has achieved so far. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for a fun fact, uh, in, in the UK policies, right, actually there is this line inside the policy document that says that you, you are actually given an option to sell your policies to third party instead of surrendering to the insurance company, which is very different in Singapore where they never do this. So that's mm -hmm. why you can see how much over there uh, United Kingdom is in this case. Nice. And in Singapore, are there any existing uh, companies or you know service providers doing something similar or exactly what you guys are doing or you guys are the first? Okay. Uh, if you are talking about just endowments, right? Yeah, uh, the major players, uh, just to share, there's reps holding, there's conservation capital, pervis capital, uh, easy capital. So you can hear a lot of capital. Like I also capital. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, so, so these, these are the actually major players for endowment plans. Okay, but I for us, we are actually the first one to consider universal life uh, investment link products or even uh, whole life policies because we really want to help people with uh, cash needs uh, in this case. So if we can expand our product line, right, then we can help more people also over here. And insurance life policy, I also just know about this term recently. Something very interesting and it's something of very high value, right, the policies. 
for the benefit of our listeners, can you share a little bit more? What is the in, uh, universal life policy? Okay. Uh, typically for universal life policies, right? Uh, they they call it uh okay. I will just put uh for every uh hundred dollars, I will just put twenty dollars first upfront. Then for the eighty dollars, I will borrow from the bank to mm. pay for it. So I will actually service the universal life policies to the bank. So the bank will actually uh, charge me an interest, maybe a two percent or three percent interest, but mm. the policy will give me four percent. So in this way, there is an arbitrage already. Right? So I can arbitrage oh. additional 1% more, right? So why should I put in more money if I can arbitrage in the safe way? And oh. if let's say the loan uh, interest increase, then with the mon- the current money at hand, right, I can just pay it off and still continue to enjoy 4% coupon. I mm, understand. This remind me of like, you know, people say they invest in property and then the rental yield is let's say uh, 5%. For example, and then the bank loan for the property is let's say four percent. So they also are be charging one percent. This is kind of similar, right? Ah uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, but then if I'm not wrong, universal life policies are only available to accredited investors. Uh. Is that right, Ethan? Uh, I would say it's high net worth because typically for universal life policies, uh, the minimum buy-in right unit is five hundred thousand. So even if you loan, right, you need to upfront pay hundred thousand. I I really don't think anyone of us, uh, uh, if we are regular salary men, uh, in the first five years, uh, we can put so much money in also. Uh, and it's also not prudent uh, to, to put wow. so much money. Five hundred thousand is really half a million. And <laughs> definitely for high net worth individuals, uh, I, I get what you mean. Usually so, a credit card investor, yeah. Mm. So let's say uh, for this five hundred thousand, which is the, the starting point Ethan mentioned, five hundred thousand uh dollars worth in, in the policy, what kind of returns can people expect from a uh, uh, is there a typical universal life payout? Uh okay. In this case, because universal life actually invests in uh debt instrument called bonds. Mm. So bonds are actually uh, something that I lend you, then I'll just uh get an interest from it, let's say about four to five percent. So that is how a universal life works. So they just uh, invest in the bonds and the bonds give them the interest. They use the interest to pay off and also have additional interest to service the policy. So that, that's how they run it. I think it's totally the same as property uh, if you look at it in this sense. Yeah, no, the more you explain, the more I'm thinking of property also. Okay, <laughs> what about uh, corporate insurance? I believe you guys also heard before of professional insurance or corporate insurance. Do you guys have buyers also willing to buy over those kind of policies? Okay, uh, for corporate insurance, it depends on whether there's cash value. Most of the corporate insurance that I know of is uh, they, they call it term life policies. Uh, they package it as they call it a key man insurance. Mm. So typically key man insurance are term life policies. There is no cash value. But in the event that a company that is cash rich, right, they may choose to buy a whole life policies. So if they buy a whole life policy, yes, yeah, we do consider whole life policies in this case. Ah, okay. Now I understand. Thank, thanks for, for explaining. So there must be a cash value in it before you guys can consider. Something that the buyer must make money off instead of like, you know, the guy passed away, then get money. So it's two different things. Yes. Uh, Actually, in the uh, UK, they do this kind of, uh, they, they call it a vertical uh, settlement, which means they really buy off the death benefit. Mm. But for, yes, so that, that is where we are also a bit worried of, uh, early on, we talked about this moral hazard. Uh, so we don't yeah. want people killing people. <laughs> so we are trying to prevent all this first until the market is mature enough, then we can consider this. Wow. That means, if I understand correctly, uh, if I buy this key man uh, insurance policy, let's say for a million dollars to, to insure myself, and then uh, I cannot service the policy anymore, uh, Dexter buys it over, and then he hire hit man to come and, uh, you know, kill me or assassinate me, then he can reap the benefits if I die. Uh. Yes, correct. So, so that is how it works out in this case. So we are trying to uh, not uh, give people this impression uh, because there is a very big moral hazard over here. But because and, and- the... I believe the Singapore law is very strict. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure someone dies, they will do the proper investigation and cause of death, etc. But is this legal in Singapore or it only uh, exists overseas for the part you mentioned, uh, the key man insurance and someone can take over? Uh, for currently, I don't think there is any company in Singapore doing this, but we hope to expand to this product in the future. Uh. So uh, like I say, we really love to help people. So we will want to make it available for as a business also together. 
Okay, thanks for sharing. Dexter, what are your, your views? Well, wow, today I really learned a lot from, from these guys. <laughs> yeah, for me, I think a lot of a lot of education involved definitely for this business because a lot of people don't even know that you can like sell away to somebody else instead of surrendering it officially. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, don't worry, guys. Um, uh, when I meet my friends again, you know, after now phase two has restarted, if I go out for social gatherings, I hear a new friend complain, hey, walao, eh, you know, now my salary drop, then no sales coming in. I still have to pay every month my all for all my endowment plans, my insurance policies. I will straight away say, you want to cancel your policy? Let me introduce you to two experts from Policy Woe. How, how does that sound? Uh, yeah, yeah. Assuming the reason is really the loss of income or reduction of income, yeah, then we will consider it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, uh, actually, uh, we do have the YouTube channel where we actually have a uh, basic financial literacy. So if your friends are really interested, they can actually tune into the YouTube channel and take a look at what what other basic uh, financial literacy, uh, financial knowledge they can learn from there. And uh, if there's any uh, more advanced one, then they may wish to talk to uh, us or even financial advisors about it. So uh, uh, to me, uh, I would definitely grill my financial advisor about all this uh, because it, it makes sense for me to to pay him, right? So I should make use of his service, right? <laughs> Correct. The word financial advisor is supposed to advise, man. That's his job. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, later we'll, uh, in the show notes below, we will be putting your YouTube channel or your website link as well. So uh, people who are viewing this podcast, they can also click on your link. They can also then, you know, uh, improve their personal financial literacy by viewing your YouTube. So I think it's very, very good that you guys are, you know, actively promoting and sharing and helping people improve their personal lives. I mean, their personal finances.